crisis like COVID-19 affects all business sectors, but there are some unique considerations that really impact the insurance industry more than most. Uh, and it's also offered a platform for growth for the insure techs out there, as evidenced by Pineapple recently securing almost 50 million rand in Series A funding. I'm joined now uh, by uh, one of the market's real insure tech disrupting startups, Pineapple CEO, Manus van Heerden. Manus, we've spoken on several occasions. So firstly, I just want to say congratulations, because the story right from inception has been one of uh, the right idea coming at the right time. But for those who don't uh, know the pineapple story, how was the seed for pineapple planted? Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for the, for the question. So pineapple was initially founded by uh, three young South Africans. We each applied to an innovation competition individually, not, not having known each other before starting the company. And, we were put together in this team uh, by the, the team at Hanover Re, and we just got along super well from the start. Uh, the team really gelled from day one, and we followed a process called design thinking, which is just looking at an industry and then seeing all the customer problems that emanate from, from that industry and then building small prototypes around solving those problems. And... With the insurance industry, we found quite a lot of challenges that are being faced by, by the industry. And you can broadly categorize them into two buckets. The first one being the trust relationship between the consumer and uh, the, the insurer, which we, in our experience, we've seen has been eroded over time. And, and we, we saw that as stemming from a, a variety of things. So firstly, a lack of transparency, customers not understanding how insurance works. So interestingly enough, we asked uh, a sample of people, do they feel like their premium helps other people? And 90% of people said, no, it doesn't, which, is, yeah. which shows you that there's a fundamental misunderstanding in how insurance works. And on the risk as a pooling. Community. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's a community that comes together to help protect each other, which is actually such a beautiful concept. I think if it was invented today, it would be a lot more transparent and social because the technology we have today enables you to introduce that affinity at scale. If you think of the likes of Facebook, Instagram, that's, that's affinity at scale. But when insurance evolved, we didn't have the technology to have that affinity at scale. So that's what we want to try and bring back now is to show people how their premium is being used to help other people and then uh, take a fixed fee and everything that's not used in the fixed fee or in the paying of claims, we pay back to the community. So it's aligning those incentives once again. So if, if customers behave well, all the premium that's left is going back into the community. So that's the first pillar of what Pineapple's doing. The second pillar is solving the access uh, challenges in insurance. So. Mm. Uh, allowing people to insure their stuff in the snap of a picture, you can insure individual items. If you just want to insure your laptop, your phone, your watch, and your car, you can do that. So you can sort of custom make your own policy by snapping pictures of, of the items it is you want to insure, and then getting insured, getting customer service over chat support, so you don't have to wait on on the on the phone for a reply. You can ask a question continue with your life later in the day that question will be answered um, a lot of our uh, service agents actually have average response times of, of under a minute so that's really changing the whole way that insurance is sold and serviced it's an entirely so, yeah, very exciting yeah, I mean, it's an entirely new business model. And you say changing the way that insurance is sold and serviced. And, and that is the issue with insurance. It's not something that South Africans roll out of bed and say, right, I'm excited. I'm going to go buy some insurance today. It is generally sold. But if you've created an affinity business model, I, I think it, it really helps in that process. It's fair. It's simple. If you're decreasing the cost, you, you, you're capping profits, you're deterring fraud, all of that. Uh, really uh, works to your favor. And it sounds very much like what a traditional South African stock bell is, uh, in essence. Uh, now, uh, that's how the, the fruit was born, so to speak. Uh, what sort of growth have you seen in the fruit so since inception? So we initially launched with our, what, we, what the traditional insurer would call an Aura's product. 
uh, which is standalone small items. So that product has sort of, it, we got great initial traction on that. Then there was steady growth and then we sort of started to see exponential growth towards the end of last year and start of this year. I think a lot of buying behavior has changed with lockdown regulations. A lot of people who we were expecting to only engage, engage full-time in e-commerce um, in 2023 started in, engaging in e-commerce a lot sooner, which I, I, I think was a to a very large extent as a result of lockdown where a lot of people were forced to buy their groceries online, transact online, etc. So South Africans, in our view, we were predicting it to be around 2023. Um, but it's moved up quite a bit now with, with the lockdown regulations. And then our motor insurance product launched into the market at the end of last year. And we've just seen incredible take up on that product. Uh, people choosing to buy their car insurance online. Uh, people who already have car insurance, comparing their, their premiums very quickly in an online basis and then switching in the click of a button. Um, I think there's a massive demand for people to be able to buy their car insurance online and, and we're definitely seeing that. And the culmination of those two things has resulted in us growing uh, just over 200% in the first oh. six months of 2021. So really exceeding our, our growth expectations, but yeah, exciting times. Very exciting. And I was chatting to the CEO of We Buy Cars the other day, uh, and it's a, an item I never thought people would buy online. I thought, no, you've got to go kick the tires, you've got to go take it for a drive. But we're seeing through We Buy Cars business model that people are now becoming um, so familiar with online, they trust the experience, if they trust the counterparty on the other side, that they're actually buying cars online as well. So uh, not surprising that we're seeing the shift now to buying your, your insurance online and uh, and really a very exciting time for a startup such as yours to be operating in. You've recently raised a Series A funding round, uh, I think it was what, 3.4 million US dollars, uh, so around about 50 million rand. What are your plans uh, with this recent uh, cash injection? So you know, maybe just a slight correction there. I think some of the journalists who initially picked it up made an error in the translation from rand to dollar. So it was it was 80 million rand the raise. So ah. I think it translates to about 5.4. Um, but yeah, you know, the plans with the raise is so uh, a lot of it will go into growth into the South African market because that's where we are seeing the majority of our growth. We we want to put a lot of focus into enhancing our motor insurance product because we've seen that there's such a demand for it. And the fact that we are by far the front runners in the country when it comes to actually selling that product through a native digital app, actually a lot of uh, other uh, value added products to that product in a way that can only be serviced through an app. So we plan on enhancing that product, then we plan on rolling out a few other insurance products as well. So that's a process that's ongoing with our existing customers. So whenever we roll out a new product, we always test it with existing customers to see what do they want and what do they want to see differently in, in that product compared to what's currently being offered. And then the third one is, so we are active in the US as a, as a technology provider where we've partnered with a company called Travelers Insurance. So they're one of the top 10 short-term insurers in the US. And we provide technology for them um, there. So the, the goal is also to expand that uh, relationship that we've got there. A, a remarkable story still, 80 million uh, rands raised. And if, if you look at what are the challenges for uh, insurtechs, I've always felt that as a banking client, uh, I interact on a banking app a lot more than I would on an insurance app. You tend to interact with your insurer at the time of claim, which hopefully is not very often. I mean, we don't take insurance out so we can all drive recklessly and claim every day. Uh, how, how are you finding uh, bridging this engagement gap? Uh, and, and what are the strengths and potential weaknesses of the model that you're working on? So, yeah, that's definitely something that we, we've tried to, to solve from the start is how do we get someone not to only in, interact with their insurer when they buy and when they claim. And 
there's quite a few ways that we've done this. The one is the rewards model where we reward people uh, for doing ad hoc things like being claims, claims free or connecting with other people inside the app, et cetera. So we, we reward good behavior on a real time basis so people can earn points and those points can be redeemed for Uber, Uber Eats vouchers, take a lot vouchers, superbalist vouchers, et cetera. So we're driving continuous engagement through that. Then uh, we've got a, a product called Drive Let's Get Blessed, where customers can get 30% uh, of their premium back if they drive less than 300 kilometers a month and they can see on the app how far they've actually driven. So that's also driving a lot of, a lot of engagement and behavior within the app. And then probably the, the biggest exciting thing we have is we're busy uh, relaunching our, our sort of wallet, what we previously called our wallet feature, which is where all the premiums that aren't used by the community gets given back to the community. And in our relaunch, we're going to be showing a lot of uh, cool new data in terms of what's happening in the community, what are people insuring, in what areas, like uh, in, in, let's say you live in Randburg, what's the most insured vehicle there? What are people claiming for their, um, what's the claims events that's happening there? Is it theft claims? Is it damage claims? So it's really building that community aspect out where people can see in real time what's really happening there. So I think the advantages of that model is that you, you get that viral growth where people talk about it more. Mm -hmm. They become more brand loyal. They, um, they tell their friends about it, et cetera. The, the, and in addition to that, their risk behavior is better because they don't defraud the insurers. They trust the insurers more because there's, a, there's an ongoing relationship. I think the downside to it is what we've heard from some traditional people is that the more you engage the, the customer on the insurance contract, the more they're continuously assessing their insurance needs. So where some of the traditional insurers might prefer to sell your policy to you and then don't engage with you often, because if I engage with you, you might say, okay, what am I paying now? Should I get different quotes? Should I reevaluate my insurance and that increases the risk of of lapses because customers might go to someone else but i think our um approach to that has always been like we want the best for the customer so if our price and our service isn't at a level where we can continue to justify to keep that customer then we must look into that and we must fix that so we we don't mind having our customers engage with us often and re reassessing their needs and reaffirming the fact that we are indeed providing them the service that they want. It's indeed a bold approach, but I think what it does is it uh, crafts an internal discipline inside the organization to continually strive to enhance that customer experience, that customer centricity that the likes of Jeff Bezos at Amazon, uh, who grew it into the biggest uh, retailer in the world, love to focus on. And I think that builds a lot of that discipline um, into the model. If you look at the future for fintech companies in Africa, it certainly looks to be looking up. The pineapple setting a benchmark in terms of what can be achieved when you've got young South African talent with access to capital, you had strong guidance and mentorship and uh, potentially setting a trend for South Africa to become something of a hub for producing globally scalable tech businesses. What do you think is the state of the fintech landscape in South Africa at the moment? And where do you see yourself fitting into that ecosystem? Yeah, so it's, it's quite a, I think, I think we can engage on that topic for the whole day because it's such <laughs> an interesting, such an interesting one to look at, especially if you look at the African market as a whole where, there's such a such a difference between what's happening in all the different ecosystems with um, with sort of mobile money in some of the ecosystems, insurance in South Africa and financial services are some of the most it's some one of the most evolved ecosystems in the world. Um, funnily enough, when we were in Europe and in the US at some of the large insurance conferences there, South Africa is. Uh, actually referenced as one of the front runners when it comes to innovation within financial services globally. 
So we are we do have a very advanced financial services system. So a lot of the fintechs, especially in the banking and payment side, is actually coming from inside the existing industry. Um, with insurance providers, I think they've struggled quite a bit to innovate due to a lot of the, the legacy systems that are being used within mm. the traditional insurers within the South African landscape. But what we are starting to see now is um, with, with Yoko also raising a massive funding round that there's, there's a lot of energy and excitement in the South African market around fintechs. And I think what's exciting then is the venture capital market starts to build out as well. And then you start seeing more entrance into the fintech and let's say technology startup space. And then you get more VCs. So it's sort of, it's sort of like a chicken and the egg problem where you need the VCs to have the startups, but you need the successful startups to give the VCs the confidence yeah. to raise the capital they need. And I think these success stories that are coming out is going to give uh, people who've got capital the confidence to put that capital into the venture capital space, which will then further create more opportunities for, for young talent. And like we've got so much talent within the South African market when it comes to the financial services space and the technology space. And I think if we can empower that talent with capital, we can really produce uh, globally exportable solutions, um, similar to what a country like Israel is doing, where they're building technology simply to export straight away into the US market. Um, and I think with, with um, our cost of doing software development in South Africa, we've got yeah. even a, a bigger opportunity here because we can build the software at a third of the price that, that it's being built in the US. And then we can add, export it there and to Europe and to Asia straight away. So I think there's there's massive opportunity there. And we've got we've got so much young talent, like the talented young developers that we are seeing coming into our organization is is amazing. Like world world class talent coming in. So yeah, I think if we can if we can keep the momentum going, it's it's really exciting. A very exciting space. And uh, I remember the early days at sitting down with the, the likes of Justin Stanford at 4DI and Kit Van Sale at, at Knife Capital. And, uh, you know, it was a slog as a VC to go out to raise a fund. Could you exit successfully? Your investors uh, weren't all that convinced. Now we're seeing the exits come through. We're seeing the, the great growth and scalable stories come through. You've got Naspass Foundry now making big deals in the space, uh, yourselves and, and so many others out there. Very, very exciting time. And I think a real bright spot for the South African economy as well, because we have that competitive advantage of the RAND and we, we really need to take advantage of that. With all of your experience so far, and just as we conclude here, Manus, what lessons have you learned over this period of building the business uh, and what advice would you have for entrepreneurs in this space at the moment? Yeah, uh, many, many lessons learned, many mistakes made in our journey so far. I think the key lesson that's sort of resonating within our organization at the moment, and actually our CTO, uh, Sizwe, introduced this concept to the team, and it's been sort of like a a building block of where everyone's headspace is is now and um, emanates from a from a quote from Nelson Mandela where he says that he is fundamentally an optimist. And that's sort of been such a core focus of our team is are we are we fundamentally optimistic about all the challenges that we encounter throughout the day? If something if something happens, what's your what's your gut response to that? Are you immediately a little bit frightened by it or are you immediately optimistic about I want to solve this problem how can I get stuck in and getting getting it done and I think with with sort of all the things that's happened in our country over the last few uh, weeks we we also started having that discussion is as South Africans we very often can become so negative about our country so quickly when there's when there's looting and riots here, we like a lot of South Africans say they want to leave and they become negative. But there's looting happening in the US that was happening there as well. And people weren't so ready to become negative and jump ship straight away. Everyone is still they're still optimistic about the future of their country. And that's where we are at is 
we are super optimistic about the future of this country. We're optimistic about our, our business propositions and in our own personal lives, everyone, we, we, we really try and focus on, let the first response be that of fundamental optimism as opposed to, as opposed to pes pessimism. Like we remain realistic about the challenges we face, but being optimistic in the way we view them just switches everyone into solutions mode because we try and solve it. We don't, we don't become negative and sit back. So I think that sort of mind shift that we've made as a team has really, really changed the way we do things. And yeah, would encourage anyone to try it for a month. Every, like anything that comes your way, just approach it from a basis of optimism and then it's a lot easier to solve your problems from there. I think a remarkable bit of advice that can uh, really encode into the culture of an organization through its people and uh, demonstrated that can-do attitude of entrepreneurship. And I tend to agree with you. Uh, you know, I'm on the front lines and we're reporting on these stories day in, day out. And if one doesn't have a, a view of, yes, the challenges are there, of being realistic, but how can we solve them? How can we collectively um, create a, a better tomorrow for our children then um, I, I really don't know how one can uh, continue to uh, to keep going. So you have to be optimistic about the future while remaining realistic about those challenges. And I think the uh, the proof is in the pudding, as uh, the growth of pineapple has shown. Uh, CEO Manus van Heerden, thank you for taking the time. Take care. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks for having us.